Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 8378 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the hydronation, maximising abundant benefits of our water resources. I can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons. Now, I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to move the motion. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please, or thereabouts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we all know, water is life, a vital part of Scotland's natural capital that underpins everything we do. Our economy, environment, health and well-being are all inextricably linked to water. With around 70% of the area and 90% of the volume of all Britain's inland surface water, Scotland is extremely fortunate to have such a critical resource in abundance. As a resource that underpins key industries like food and drink, water, of course, also presents opportunity. That's an opportunity to develop its value, to understand and optimise its use, to harness its power to increase the productivity and efficiency of our industries, and an opportunity to enjoy its aesthetic qualities and contribution to our health, well-being and leisure. We should demonstrate exemplary practice in managing all of our natural resources, leading by example, and sharing with the world the knowledge and expertise we have acquired in water. All of these factors come together under the aims and objectives of the Hydro Nation. Our vision of Scotland as a Hydro Nation recognises the critical importance of water as part of our national and international identity. Today I'll outline how we are developing the economic and non-economic value of our water resources to deliver on our ambition to be a world leader in its responsible management. The approach is ambitious, innovative and outward-looking. It places the people of Scotland at its centre, recognises our duty to them and to the environment which sustains us all. In a world where over a billion people do not have access to clean water and many more live without basic sanitation, we see a clear role for Scotland to help make a difference. I'll set out some of the groundbreaking international work being undertaken in the name of Hydronation that is already improving lives and underpinning this government's commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But let me begin closer to home. In Scottish Water, we benefit from a world-class utility providing water and sewerage services delivered through a public ownership model for the benefit of the vast majority of people in Scotland. We can take great pride that year on year, its levels of performance show what can be achieved by a well-managed and highly motivated public sector organisation. Since establishment, Scottish Water has reduced service costs by over 40%, environmental incidents by 34% and leakage by 50%. Equally significantly, Scottish Water has reduced its carbon footprint by nearly a quarter since first reported in 2006. And this year, the company reached an important milestone by facilitating enough renewable generation to meet 100% of its electricity requirements. I want to emphasise that all of this is in the context of an average household charge some £38 lower than in England and Wales. As well as underpinning our economy as a whole, water is a key business sector in its own right, now recognised as such by our enterprise and development agencies, so that we can tailor and deliver the support it needs to grow and flourish. Scottish Development International has recently published an updated capability statement that presents our key strengths, experience and expertise. And in terms of the breadth of business support, innovation is integral to our approach. The establishment of the Hydro Nation Water Innovation Service means that the sector is now benefiting from targeted and dedicated specialist one-to-one -one support to help tackle barriers faced by small and medium-sized businesses in bringing their products to market. This is supported by two full-scale testing facilities at operational Scottish water sites, Gothlec for water treatment and Bones for wastewater. And during the summer, I visited the Gothlec plant and saw for myself how it is helping innovative businesses develop their products. It's also hosting technical trials to review the feasibility of employing decentralized water supplies for remote households growing our understanding of the options for an alternative provision model for those on private supplies struggling to maintain their existing supply. We remain fully committed to the service and are at an advanced stage of preparing to procure its evolution. 
Sitting alongside the industry, our academic and research sector is delivering groundbreaking research, including through CRU and our innovative and challenging postgraduate Hydronation Scholars Programme. CRU is Scotland's centre of expertise for waters. Funded by the Scottish Government and hosted by the James Hutton Institute, CRU provides a vital knowledge hub where calls for research are coordinated across academic institutions, government and the water sector, helping to improve the understanding of water in the environment, industry, pollution, resource management and technology. The Scholars Programme is designed to deliver the water leaders of the future with a cohort of 19 talented PhD scholars studying a wide range of topics identified as key to moving understanding forward and enhancing Scotland's reputation as a centre for academic excellence. The programme delivered its first alumnus this summer. Our industry is supported by a unique and internationally respected model of governance and regulation, which reflects the sense of community and shared purpose that Hydronation has engendered. Our economic, environmental and drinking water quality regulators work closely and interconnectedly with government and Scottish water to drive improved performance and promote the sector's interests. Their expertise and impact is increasingly recognised through demand for advisory services to help address challenges in other jurisdictions. We have recently established the Hydronation International theme to reach out to the world to share our academic excellence and expertise in water governance and water management technology. Our approach aims to bring better coherence, alignment and consistency to our international activity, including the management of collaborative research projects and deliver more actively managed academic networks that can respond collectively to funding call opportunities and support other opportunities for the wider sector. And I must here make special mention of Malawi, a country with which we enjoy a special relationship. We are committed to supporting Malawi through Hydronation's contribution to the Climate Justice Fund with the aim of making the Sustainable Development Goal 6 a reality. And that programme has already delivered access to clean and safe water to over 33,000 people, over 6,000 people with improved water resource management skills, and over 4,000 people using new irrigation techniques and conservation agriculture practices. We're building on these successes by extending the scope to include water pump technology enhancement trials, which will increase their efficiency. And we are working with major UK retailers to secure in-country water sustainability for key export products such as tea and coffee. And we're also responding to the huge potential and need in India in relation to water resources by engaging with key Indian partners to introduce hydronation and help build links between the scientific research and business communities. We are exploring with our Indian partners the mechanisms to develop pilot technical projects with potential to tackle some of India's most pressing water issues. In considering how hydronation can make a significant global impact, we also recognise the potential within the public sector to provide commercial and advisory services related to water. My officials are working with a number of bodies, including SEPA, WICS and Scottish Water International, to understand and develop the potential for cross-sectoral collaboration and the structures to support that. In these remarks, I set out how we are delivering across each of the themes set out in the Hydronation strategy, agreed with the Hydronation Forum that I chair, supporting our domestic industry, maintaining and improving service and quality standards for customers, and driving down carbon impacts through innovative energy generation. For those on private supplies, uh, we will continue to pursue suitable options for an alternative provision model. We will build on our academic strengths to ensure Scotland's place as a thought leader on water issues and continue delivering on our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals through targeted international activity. We will develop and support new commercial opportunities for our businesses and public bodies at home and overseas, developing our water economy and enhancing its contribution to a low carbon economy that benefits all of Scotland. And I hope, Presiding Officer, uh, with these remarks that I'm able to bring home to members in the chamber who might not otherwise have been aware of the breadth of activity uh, which goes on beneath that broad heading of hydronation, uh, that Scotland is being recognised internationally as a country with expertise parallel to none. And I really uh, want to commend hydronation to the chamber.
Could you please move uh, the motion? Sorry? You didn't move it. I move the motion. <laughs> I call now on Donald Cameron to speak to and move Amendment S5M 08378.1. Seven minutes are there about, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I uh, move the amendment in my name. Um, I'm delighted to open for the Scottish Conservatives in this important debate about Scotland's water. Living about an hour away from Dalness in beautiful Glen Etive, which is Britain's wettest place, and in an area, the West Highlands, which is one of the wettest parts of w Western Europe, I have seen my fair share of water. But as a result, I particularly appreciate the value of our water and the many means by which we can use it to benefit local communities and our economy. And I'm proud of the fact that the region I represent here does contribute such a significant and important natural resource. And I am upbeat that there has been progress made in delivering the ultimate goal of making Scotland a hydro nation. In relation to the review report, we on this side of the chamber welcome the publication of this report. And can I thank the Scottish Government for publishing it well in advance of this debate. Indeed, we welcome the fact that this report was produced past the point at which reports are required by statute. And we hope that the Scottish Government will continue to provide Parliament with regular updates on how the agenda for the Hydro Nation progresses through the lifetime of this Parliament. I'm delighted that much progress is being made. And given that Scotland's water is worth £1.8 billion per annum to the Scottish economy, it is vital that we continue to invest, improve, and lead the way in building the water economy. As the, as the report notes, there are many areas of progress which we welcome, and I would also like to pay tribute to the Scholars Programme, which, as the report notes, has produced its first scholar, Dr. Christopher Schultz, alongside 16 other PhD scholars who are immersed in the programme. I'm also proud of the fact that while we continue to build our own water industry and economy, we are sharing those practices internationally, in particular uh, with developing countries like Malawi, uh, which I will talk about later on, in order to allow them to help uh, develop a thriving water economy. We also welcome the fact that as a result of this focus on the water economy, new technologies are being brought to market, which will help over time boost the economic benefit of Scotland's water. And in particular, we know that one of the goals of the Hydro Nation is to deliver a low carbon water nation and to ensure that we manage our water resource so that it reduces its carbon intensity. To that effect, it would have been interesting if the report had elaborated further about what is specifically being done in this area, particularly what progress has been made in delivering new technologies to treat wastewater and produce clean drinking water, which we know is very energy intensive. And it will be interesting to learn about the success of the new water treatment technologies currently being trialled at Gorthlec, which the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, uh, the innovation test centre there. In terms of global commitments, we strongly welcome the work being done by the programme to support other countries developing similar water programmes. And I am encouraged by the strength of our continued relationship with Malawi and the manner in which this long-standing and historical connection has allowed us to share ideas, create new success stories for one another and cement the positive impact that multi-nation partnerships have on the state and its citizens. And the report notes many positive steps in this relationship and how we are helping Malawi to develop its water economy, ensuring that its citizens can have the kind of access to water that we often take for granted here. Furthermore, we are encouraged by the support that has been offered to India and the best practice that is being shared with developed countries such as Ireland, Canada and Australia. However, our global commitments to improve water resource will not simply be met through the action of one government, which is why I strongly welcome the interventions of the UK government and its excellent record in this sphere. The UK government has committed to ensuring that another 60 million people are able to access clean water and sanitation by 2020, an ambitious target, but one that will only be met through our continued commitment to international development. And between 2011 and 2015, DFID has helped 64.5 million people gain access to clean water, improve sanitation, or better hygiene con conditions through the building of new wells pumps, standpipes, toilets and sewerage system, work which complements that carried out by the Scottish Government and indeed by private sector organisations, charities and others here in Scotland. And of course, the drive to improve global water access and treatment doesn't just extend to the efforts of the Scottish or UK governments, but our people have played a strong part in supporting water development abroad. And across Scotland, there are many individuals and small businesses and charities 
who have set out to go further and support people that the state hasn't yet been able to help. Scottish firms such as the Edinburgh-based beer firm Brugada are one good example. They were set up with a mission to donate 100% of their profits to clean water charities and set a target of ensuring 1 million people can get access to drinking water. So far, they have helped 33,000 people and supported 60 different projects in Malawi since 2016. And I'm sure everyone across the chamber wishes them the best of luck as they can strive to meet their overarching target. Of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it may be that one of Mr. Cameron's colleagues can answer this in his speech. Uh, the first part of the amendment talks about recovery of phosphorus. And I just uh, would be interested to know if that is for economic reasons or environmental reasons, because, of course, by the time the phosphorus from human waste is in waste water, uh, the, it is extremely dilute, and I think it's not an economic recovery. So if someone in the Conservative benches addresses that, I'd be very interested. Well, there's a technical question for you, Mr Cameron. <laughs> Do you have the answer? Thank you. It, it's, it's certainly an environmental point, if I can put it like that, but uh, Morris Golden will, will go on to, to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is a hospital pass, if ever there was one. Um, <laughs> Um, there is a need to go further, Deputy Presiding Officer. Whilst the report sets out clear areas where there have been achievements, we on these benches feel there are other important areas that have not been covered by the report. For example, there continues to be a concern over pharmaceutical pollution, which is largely caused by improper disposal of medicines. And the non-profit organisation Healthcare Without Harm state that many wastewater treatment facilities are un unable to completely filter out many of those pharmaceutical drugs. And as a result, these pollutants can impact land and other surface waters as a result. Uh, similarly, there are issues with the number of PCB chemicals which are not able to be removed from wastewater. One local issue in my own region that I am acutely aware of, and was mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, um, and I've dealt with several case, cases on behalf of constituents, is the difficulty that many people have who live in remote areas about getting onto the mains water supply, and instead have to rely on a private supply where the water quality and flow can often be an issue, and I would press the Cabinet Secretary to work hard for those people in that position. Um, whilst there are obvious logistical challenges, uh, if we are to have a truly inclusive water economy, we should not forget the needs of everyone resident in Scotland when it comes to accessing a safe and reliable water supply. In conclusion, I'd like to end by reiterating, while there are some areas that need improvement, the Scottish Conservatives are confident there is good progress being made in a number of areas, and we commend the government and their agencies for facilitating that progress. Please move your amendment. Everybody's forgetting to move things today. I, I, thought, I, I, I thought I had moved. Had it, you? I, I do. Oh, I, I, I my apologise, Mr. Cameron. You're ahead of me. I now call Claudia Beamish to speak to move amendment S5M 08378.3. Ms. Beamish, five minutes or thereabouts, right, please. Thank you. I'll, I'll start, uh, presiding officer, by moving the amendment to my name. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you. Uh, I welcome the new Hydro Nation um, update report. Our dramatic coastlines, glistening locks, powerful rivers and peaceful canals are important to Scotland at a fundamental level. Water resources support numerous industries, bring in tourism, boost our health and well-being and provide around a quarter of our renewable energy output. And of course, we drink it. The continued preservation of the purity of our water resources and the careful monitoring of our supply is deeply important. The beauty of water landscapes is a strong pull for many tourists visiting Scotland and the variety of attractions provided to us by both nature and the innovative industries caters to many interests. When people around the world think of Scotland, our whisky comes to the minds of many. This iconic industry absolutely relies on a pure and reliable water source. While you might need an extremely refined palate to guess the source of the water used, clean water is used in numerous uh, vital stages of the whisky making process. Water is so significant as well for our sense of well-being. I would like to highlight our canal system, a public asset which has had progressive strides in diversifying its value thanks to the efforts of Scottish canals. In Glasgow, a collaborative initiative, the Metropolitan Glasgow Strategic Drainage Partnership, is underway to alleviate flood risk, also a very important aspect of the management of our water, and regenerate the underused land along canalways. In Mary Hill in Glasgow, canal side land is being developed for social housing. This is a high quality placemaking uh, initiative, 
and the canal holds special opportunities for further development in recreation and tourism, active travel and environmental improvement. Hydropower is one of our oldest forms of renewable energy and my colleagues on these benches will say more about this as well. It is easy to visualise the harnessable energy from the power of a rushing river or a burn. The capacity potential of hydropower is significant, enough, I understand, to power over a million homes. But achieving this is complex and will require joined up policy across all levels of government. For communities with water sources nearby, small scale hydro schemes are an exciting opportunity. In my own region of South Scotland, members of the Straven Town Mill have plans for a hydro scheme to generate electricity for the Straven Town Mill Arts and Heritage Centre. Straven Town Mill is an example of a small charity dealing with big organisations and agencies such as Scottish Water, SEPA, and the local authority, and Scottish Power as well. With complex processes and contracts to negotiate, I see it is very prohibitive for such organisations, except for the most determined applicants. Consideration should be given to allocating a project manager who can act as an overarching liaison on behalf of a community group such as this. The nature of hydro energy means output will fluctuate with the weather, but can make a pro projecting an income very, and it can make projecting an income very difficult. Yet funding requests will require applicants to provide detailed forecasts. Furthermore, this year's revaluation of business rates has left some small-scale hydro schemes facing rates increase of up to 650%. I understand, completely unsustainable and unaccommodating. We should be doing more to, to we should be doing all we can uh, to help these community-led initiatives stand on their own two feet and to recognise the importance of the hydropower sector on all scales to Scotland's future energy. If we truly want to support public initiatives and bolster community ownership, simplicity and flexibility are key. In the context of the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which the Cabinet Secretary has already referred to, of course this chamber recognises the, daily, recognises the daily and pervasive challenge of water safety and scarcity that many countries around the world face. The Hydra Nation's targeted support through the Climate Justice Fund is so important for the empowerment of communities in these nations such as Malawi, Zambia, Tanzania and Rwanda. And the Cabinet Secretary also highlighted uh, the work in India. And I know from the... Um, from uh, having been on the cross-party group for Malawi until recently, that um, the policy coherence across the portfolios is really important in what the Scottish Government is doing here. Water is, of course, our most basic need, and the benefits of a reliable and clean water source permeate to so many aspects of life. While there is much in the Tory amendment to support, especially in relation to uh, talking about the waste water challenges and dealing with those more robustly uh, and the recognition of the need for further flood management, we are not in a position to support their amendment today due to the possible implication of more privatisation of the business stream part of Scottish water, which would not, in our view, be in the public interest. Uh, we will, though, be supporting the... Yes, sorry. First, the member's just closing. Sorry? I, I said you're just me. closing, you're in your last... Right. Uh, I've given you a little bit extra seconds. time. I'll give you another 30 <laughs> seconds. Right, OK, thank you. We'll be supporting the Scottish Government motion today. Um, and uh, I remove the motion in my name again, just in case. Oh, well, well, <laughs> that's all right by me. Um, <laughs> we now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or thereabouts. There's a little bit of time in hand for interventions, and you'll get your time made up. Bruce Crawford, please, followed by Peter Chapman. Mr Crawford. Officer, the Scottish Government's ambition to build the nation of Scotland into a truly hydro nation is an expiring approach to utilising our country's world-renowned natural resource. And I'd like to use my time today in this short debate to share how my sterling constituency that I represent can contribute to one of the Scottish Government's key objectives, in particular promoting our water resource as a source of clean, green economic benefit. But I want to, well, but I want to do that whilst assessing our relationship with our water resource in a wide context. Members will be aware that the spectacular Loch Katrin is located in my constituency. Not only is Loch Katrin the birthplace of Rob Roy McGregor, but it's also been the primary source of water for much of the city of Glasgow and the surrounding area 
since the mid-1800s. The connecting infrastructure to Mulgai Water Treatment Works was initially opened by Queen Victoria in 1859 with a second aqueduct in 1901. Today, Loch Katrin is owned by Scottish Water, which manages a system that can deliver almost half a billion litres of water, yes, half a billion litres of water a day to 700,000 resident, 700, residents. It's a hell of a lot of water for 700 residents, right enough. 700,000 residents in the surrounding area. <laughs> Indeed, the loch is famously the water source for one of Scotland's most widely consumed pints, Tenants Lager. Loch Catron's contribution to the local area does not stop at its impressive supply of quality consumable water, of course. It's also a global attraction for tourists from around the globe. The SS Walter Scott steamboat has provided sailings on the loch for 170 years now, and it's still a huge hit with visitors. It's an incredible asset, Loch Catron, to local community, encouraging visitor support to local businesses, and a perfect example of a natural water, water resource being used to further the economic potential of the surrounding area. Now, Loch Catron is, of course, nestled in the heart of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, an area I share with Jackie Bailey, and occasionally I've had ice cream alongside the water of Loch Lomond. <laughs> Loch Lomond and Trossachs area is now home to 44 approved hydro schemes, of which 35 are currently in operation. And the total output of the National Park is now 21.7 megawatts, which is enough to power a staggering 15,400 homes or almost half of my constituency. And that includes the Calendar Hydro Project Scheme that sells energy produced to enable them to create a financial revenue stream for the entire community of Calendar. And I was a bit surprised that Claudia Beamish picked up on the business rates issue, because I understand that from, this, from the hydro operators in my part of the world, they're quite delighted with the discount scheme that was brought in by Derek Mackay, the Finance Secretary, to deal with that uh, um, whole issue. President officer, I have... Yeah? Uh, you can, Mr Crawford, but you're staggering into your uh, last minute. That, that was what I'd seconds. understood from the, from the community group, that, that that had been increased. So I will follow that up. Thank you for that point. Mr Crawford. President, I've shared a taste of what's happening in my constituency today because of, because about the relationship with water and what can be taken in other parts of the country and what we can do around the globe. Now, obviously, Loch Catron project was born out of a radical public reform issue uh, for the city, for the health of the city of Glasgow. Can you just imagine what we could, if we did, could do that two centuries ago, what we could do more and extra we could do around the globe today? Very quickly, in closing, President Officer, um, I think we need to be a bit more imaginative also about how we use our water resource. And I'd like to promote the idea that the A84 that connects my constituency to Oban is a perfect route for numerous small hydro schemes that power charging points for electric vehicles. Such an approach would go some way to repairing our country for phasing out of petrol and diesel vehicles. All of that would take some of the out-of-the-box thinking. President Officer, I'll leave members with that thought on how best we can utilise the fantastic resource that is Scotland's water. Thank you very much. Peter Chapman, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Chapman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And again, I need to re register uh, my interest in relation to farming. Um, thank you to those who gave opening speeches that highlighted both the great water resources we have here in Scotland and that today's debate will be a consensual one. Scotland has the wettest climate in the United Kingdom which many farmers are all too aware of after this season's stop-start harvest. This has been one of the most difficult harvests for many years, and I have to go back to 1985 to remember one as wet as this. It has meant combines stuck in fields, high dry gra grain drying costs, and real frustration for our farmers. However, presiding officer, too much rain can be a nuisance. Too little rain, as is the case in many parts of the world, is a disaster. In a world constantly demanding more food and water, Scotland is in a, an enviable position, which means that Scotland is green, beautiful, and agriculturally productive. 
And because of our abundant and pure supplies, Scotland is one of Europe's leaders in bottled water production, a real growth story, building successful businesses which are taking a big share of the ever-increasing demand for bottled water. Now, water is instrumental in the production of many of our key food and drink industries. The Scotch whisky industry, for example, one of Scotland's greatest assets, uses large quantities of water throughout the production process. And without adequate supplies of pure, clean water, the whole distilling industry could not survive. Now, Scotch whisky is the UK's top contributor to the UK balance of trade. It's Scotland's largest export and it contributes nearly five billion a year to the economy. And this industry is built on our natural water resources and our fine malting barley. I am proud to see Scotland and the United Kingdom doing so much internationally to share our knowledge and help nations all over the world access clean drinking water and better sanitation. Something we can take for granted living in such a, a water rich country Hydronation contributing to the Climate Justice Fund, which supports work in Malawi, is a good example of Scotland helping internationally. And the UK government's Department for International Development is committed, committed to matching the success of the 2011 to 2015 programme by helping at least another 60 million people get access to clean water and sanitation by 2020. I am pleased to see also the first students participating in the Hydro Nation Scholar Programme are approaching the completion of their PhD studies. I wish them success in their future and hope they can use their expertise to help with Scotland's Hydro Nation future. Scotland also has a long and proud history of hydropower development. This technology is one of the oldest forms of renewable energy in Scotland, with roots going back more than half a century. Indeed, in the north of Scotland, way back then, I remember we didn't speak about getting electricity installed. We called it the hydro. Scotland also has huge capacity for pumped storage, a technology that can bring multiple benefits to the generation system, ensuring that power is always available when it is most needed, providing power at peak demand and then using cheap electric at night when demand is low to pump water back up to the high dam, ready to be released again the next day. And hydropower already provides around a quarter of Scotland's renewable energy output, the equivalent of 12% of our electricity needs. With significant untapped resources, the homegrown industry has potential to deliver even more. In this debate, I have mentioned this, just some of the great benefits of Scotland's abundant water supply, how we can maximize our potential and how we have and will continue to share our knowledge and expertise around the world. I welcome the government's ambition for Scotland to become a world-leading hydro nation. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Sitting to the right of the fireplace in our living room at home is a large paraffin lamp. And that is relevant to this because that is the lamp that my wife used to do her homework to until the hydro delivered electricity power to 14 Loch End, uh, just outside uh, Inverness when she was uh, at school. So the history of Scotland is interwoven uh, with the history uh, of water. Uh, we, of course, are fortunate that when we go out of the building here and at night the rain is coming down, we curse gently and reach for our brolly or our uh, waterproof cap. Uh, while in the Sahara, they would be dashing around to collect and preserve that precious resource. Because for many in the world, access to water, in particular to potable water, uh, is increasingly diff difficult. And it's undoubtedly the case uh, that it's so precious that it's been the, the cause of battles, of wars, and it may again uh, be so in future. It is, of course, a naturally occurring chemical. Uh, H2O is probably, uh, even for those who have no particular knowledge of chemistry, the most highly recognized chemical formula uh, in the world, universally. But we who are fortunate owe a duty uh, to those uh, less fortunate. The distribution is maladroit. Where there are huge communities of people around the world, there is often little water. 
So we have the potential to show the way in the technologies of water. Uh, we can show leadership. We have heard from Bruce Crawford about our Victorian predecessors creating the infrastructures upon which we continue uh, to depend. Um, and there was great debates at the time, in particular in Glasgow, when it was wastewater infrastructure that was being put in, as to whether it was economically or, or so socially desirable to do. Not a debate that I could contemplate there being any uh, uh, interest in uh, today. So water delivers a public good in Scotland and around the world, but it must also be delivered for public good, not simply incidentally deliver it. And Scottish water is an exemplar in how we as a government of all hues uh, can use our resources in a way that benefits our communities. But also by using natural resources to generate power, there's an excess of resource in Scottish water that enables them to support others around the world. <coughs> there is, of course, in our uh, infrastructure, uh, there's redundant assets, disused sewage treatment works that could become modern recycling plants. Uh, there's a hint of a desire to recycle, uh, and I'm waiting to hear uh, from Maurice Golden about phosphorus, which, of course, uh, originally came from human wastewater, uh, originally discovered in 1699. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's what he is encouraging us uh, to return to. Climate change is one of the things that is causing an even bigger skew in the availability of water to people around the world. The Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice has made this one of their central planks of their campaign. Uh, and I'm always very happy uh, to support uh, them. In Scotland, too, uh, one of our most important exports is, of course, whisky. Uh, and uh, as the minister will undoubtedly uh, criticise my uh, pronunciation, ushkava, the ushk means water. It's the essential ingredient of our national drink, presiding officer. Jackie Bailey, please, be followed by Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon, particularly because I have hydro schemes in my own constituency, which contribute a great deal to the local economy. Scotland was, of course, one of the first countries in the world to harness electricity from its waters. And as many in the chamber will know, the Labour Party has a proud history of using hydropower to deliver social improvement. Indeed, it was the late Tom Johnson, born, of course, in Kirk and Tillich, former Labour Secretary of State for Scotland, who was the driving force behind the Hydroelectric Development Scotland Act, an act with the ambition to deliver power and social improvement to the people of the Highlands. The creation of the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board was established following the Act and is regarded, I believe, as one of Tom Johnson's greatest achievements. The Board's first hydroelectric scheme was in my constituency at Sloy Dam at the top of Loch Lomond, and that was commissioned in 1950. Now, presiding officer, we are nothing if not parochial. So I would, of course, argue that Loch Lomond rivals Loch Catherine, and may I point out that Bruce Crawford and I did indeed share an ice cream on the campaign trail. I am also duty bound to point out that he didn't pay for it. <laughs> Scotland's hydro legacy is still visible. The hydro building programme in the 50s and 60s resulted in infrastructure which still produces electricity today. Sloy Dam is still going strong. And then there are the new hydropower schemes in my area at Luss and plans for a community run scheme in Arica too. At present, we know that hydropower is used to supply something like 12% of Scottish energy. But there is huge untapped potential to develop more hydro schemes. In my area, I've found that actually smaller schemes are highly efficient, generally have fewer environmental concerns attached to them, and also create a number of new and highly skilled jobs. But in order to make the potential of the hydropower sector a reality, I believe the Scottish Government must ensure that it is doing everything in its power to create an environment in which businesses feel comfortable about making those long-term investment decisions which will create and sustain these jobs. And that takes me, presiding officer, to a brief discussion on business rates. And I welcome, very much welcome, 
the Finance Secretary's recent announcement that he will fast-track valuation of hydro schemes and increase the upper threshold to a rateable value of £5 million from the 1st of April 2018. But that said, there is an absence of clarity as to whether schemes over one megawatt will be entitled to any rates relief at all. And these businesses are struggling with a huge increase in business rates right now. Indeed, what I considered a small-scale hydropower plant in my own constituency, with a size of 1.042 megawatts, went from paying nothing in business rates up to April 2016, to now paying more than £90,000 for this financial year alone. They receive no relief whatsoever, despite being only 0.04 megawatts over the limit. There is little that they can do to reduce their costs, except restructure their business. And when you start to restructure your business, there is the possibility of losing staff. This is a hydro scheme which is not only producing renewable energy, which is good for our environment, but it's a business which creates good quality jobs and contributes hugely to our local economy in my constituency. So I would respectfully ask the Scottish Government to consider again business rates relief for hydro projects. Otherwise, many may struggle to survive and new projects might not proceed beyond the drawing board. Thank you. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've said before that climate change is one of the defining issues of our age, and in the Highlands and Islands, there is loads of great work going on to enable us to find low-carbon solutions to our energy needs. Harnessing the renewable energy potential we have could transform my region from a low-wage economy with a long history of migration to a high-wage economy which attracts people in. I'm going to illustrate this point with a couple of hydro and marine energy examples because water is an abundant resource where I come from. More than half of Scotland's hydroelectric schemes are currently operating in the Highlands and Islands and hydropower continues, um, contributes about 12% of Scotland's electricity. There are opportunities in my region though and elsewhere in the country to expand our hydropower industry and we need to take them. In Ullapol, where I grew up, the community has been working really hard together to create their own successful hydro project over the last few years. At the opening of the Parliament last year, um, representatives from Broom Power were my local heroes. Um, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary and all my colleagues would join me in congratulating the volunteers for all their hard work and perseverance, which has now delivered their project on time and within budget. The steep-sided glens in the Lal Forest and the very reliable 110 centimetres of annual rainfall that we get <laughs> make the burns just south of Ullapool pretty energetic. The project has the backing of the Scottish Government and the opportunity arose from an invitation from the Forestry Commission for Scotland um, for communities to develop hydro projects in local state-owned woodland through the National Forest Land Scheme. So Loch Broom Community Renewables Limited raised funds to take forward the project with a community share offer with the strapline Invest Today and Change Tomorrow. The project raised 900,000 from individual bus and businesses last summer and next month Flow, the turbine given that inspirational name by local school children, will be generating electricity and I look forward to going along to the switch on in a few weeks. The brilliant thing about Broom Power is not just that local folk who invested might make some money, but any surplus income from the scheme will be used for projects in the future, and that community benefit fund will go on for the next 20 years. Marine energy is another way that the renewables industry in the Highlands and Islands can be a constructive part of the hydro nation. The Highlands and Islands is home to one of the most active tidal areas in the world, the Pentland Firth and the waters around Orkney. And this area of sea around our, off our north coast contains 50% of the UK's tidal resource and 25% of Europe's tidal resource, with an incredible potential for marine energy generation. So it's no wonder that Orkney is home to the European Marine Energy Centre, the world's only grid-connected wave and tidal test site. And of course we have Maygen in the Pentland Firth, a world leader in tidal energy deployment, which set a new record in tidal stream power. Um, production earlier this year. It's a really exciting industry that has incredible potential. The abundant resource that we have up there 
and the cross-fertilisation of private industry and academic research make Orkney a fine example of a living laboratory. And the people working there are ambassadors for Scottish marine energy worldwide. We are so lucky in the Highlands and Islands and across Scotland to have such potential in our natural, natural resources. And water is without doubt central to that potential. The government's hydronation ad agenda will make an important contribution to fulfilling that potential. And that is great news for the Highlands and Islands and it's great news for Scotland. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I welcome this debate this afternoon on the Hydro Nation? It's particularly heartening to hear about the work that's been taking place on international development. Um, I went to Malawi a number of years ago and met people who are you know, directly impacted by this. Um, the difference between life and death, whether people have access to irrigation and sanitation is hugely important. But I'd like to just turn some of my comments to Scotland. And I think one of the most dramatic benefits that's come as a result of our membership of the European Union has been the directives that have improved the quality of our water every single turn of that water cycle. From the tap to the treatment works, from the rivers to the seas, our EU directives have set standards that have protected the health of our bodies, our beaches and our watercourses. So it's vital that EU directives remain as the solid base for our environmental standards going forward, whatever our future relationship may be with the European Union. And without the backstop of the European Court of Justice to enforce standards, I do remain concerned about future Scottish governments rolling back on good progress. So I do ask the Cabinet Secretary, perhaps in closing, to tell us what will replace the ECJ, given this government has now rejected environmental courts. Now, keeping Scottish water in public hands is critical to delivering public needs at a time when pressures for post-Brexit market liberalisation will only grow. Alan Sutherland, the Chief Executive of the Water Industry Commission for Scotland, said recently that, in his personal view, the introduction of household competition for water would be a derisory idea. Now, Scottish Water has done little analysis of the impact of the EU-Canada CETA trade deal. But if the public status of Scottish Water isn't challenged under CETA, then it certainly could be under future trade deals cobbled together as part of Empire 2.0. There are risks, and the Scottish Government should be mindful of them as it seeks to develop its, pos its position on trade further. Now, we started the week with a debate about technologies from the past that have no future, so it's good to shift the debate to a technology that had a critical role in our past and will have for centuries to come. Now, like Jackie Bailey, I'm a big fan of Tom Johnson, a former um, West of Stirling, West, Stirlingshire West uh, uh, MP, and of course the Labour Party's early work was always its best, and the post-war and the post-war vision, the post-war vision of the Hydro Board brought hope and power to the Glens. And I've, I doubt whether all the projects would have got through today's environmental regulations, but they delivered Scotland's first renewables revolution. And I was privileged to meet um, Pat Agnew, um, an engineer, pamphleteer, and Green Party energy spokesperson in Scotland for, for many years, who worked on Kruken Project and many others during that Tom Johnston era. And 30 years ago, he envisaged a second renewables revolution based on wind working with hydro. He's sadly no longer with us, but his vision is definitely still alive in the aspirations of this government today. Um, and in this century, we see communities using hydro's strong social license to build new generation. And I'd also like to join with Bruce Crawford in paying tribute to the Calendar Community Development Trust, whose project on the Stank Glen fit seamlessly with the landscape while delivering great financial benefits to the town. There's a huge amount of uh, potential for community hydro, but we have to look at how we add certainty and de-risk the development of projects. Certainly the UK government's cut in renewable support has been damaging, especially for hydro, given its high upfront capital costs. And the kind of constant tinkering with the subsidy regimes destroys certainty for projects that are seeking commercial finance. Dramatic increases in business rates, although they've been averted for the time being, grid capacity constraints and charging regimes that don't recognise the benefits hydro brings to the energy system can combine to collapse projects. And of course, if we don't get projects, we don't get community profit sharing in there as well. I appreciate many of these issues are not within the direct control of the Scottish Government, but building a unified position in this Parliament to support the next chapter in our Hydro Nation story is certainly worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you.
I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, in four minutes, it's difficult to do justice to um, the magnitude of the, the topic, although I was tempted to donate my four minutes to Bruce Crawford, if only to find out how the afternoon with Jackie Bailey on the banks of Loch Lomond uh, was to develop. Um, Jackie Bailey has put an end to such speculation. Uh, as the MSP for Orkney, I need no persuading about the extent to which our identity is indeed shaped uh, by water. At this time of year, uh, that shaping can be rather more re robust and unremitting than we would like. But nevertheless, the energy aspects of, of the government's motion, which I strongly support, uh, are ones to which I would add, as Marie Todd did, um, the notion of wave and, uh, and, and tidal energy. Uh, but I think it, it's right that many have focused on the significant potential that there is within hydro, which are, already plays a, a significant part uh, in our renewables uh, production. There is real potential, though, to grow that. And I think Jackie Bailey's point about the small-scale uh, projects, I think, is one uh, worth uh, holding on to. Uh, I think through pump storage, there is also an, a, an opportunity to address security of supply issues uh, as well. But this needs routes to market, and I would very much associate myself uh, with some of the comments that Mark Russell just made uh, in relation to the challenges facing uh, that sector. Um, but I would like to concentrate my uh, remarks uh, on the international ac activity and as the co-convener of the cross-party group on Malawi, uh, I was delighted to see Claudia Beamish's uh, amendment highlighting the Climate Justice Fund uh, and the uh, work specifically in relation to Malawi. Uh, I would like to maybe talk about a couple of projects in that regard, one alluded to by the Cabinet Secretary in her uh, opening remarks and I pay tribute to Strathclyde University who I know are um, heavily involved uh, in a wide range of areas uh, in Malawi but one in particular one project in particular to widen access to safe drinking water uh, has been enabled through the Climate Justice Fund Water Futures uh, Programme and Professor uh, Callan has challenged his students uh, to come up with a device that could uh, be retrofitted to the almost ubiquitous hand pumps that you see in Malawi. Uh, Benjamin McIntosh, Michaelis and his colleagues uh, certainly rose to that challenge and through the Afri Dev uh, High Lift uh, we now see um, the ability to deliver water well beyond the pump and, and to the premises, to, to clinics and, and, and other buildings that was simply was not possible before, where water was having to be delivered by hand, off, usually by women and by children, and often over very large uh, distances. I have failed to do it justice, but uh, more information is in a recent Scotsman article. It was published last month, uh, courtesy of David Hope Jones, who provides the Secretariat to the CPG. Uh, the other project is, uh, is taken forward through the Tier Fund uh, Scotland, again supported through the Climate Justice Fund, uh, and which deals with issues uh, to, to do with food, food security, uh, but also the availability um, of uh, clean and, and safe water, um, but through the better management of water re resources uh, on the ground. Uh, one of the projects is, is delivered in Salima District, where the local community there uh, are taking back more control. And I was um, sent a, an email earlier on uh, this week by Charlie Bevan, who works for Tier Fund Scotland, uh, who, which brought home the significant impact that this, uh, this project is having uh, for, uh, for that community in terms of delivering safe and clean water. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are uh, undoubtedly a hydro nation. Exploiting that is a logical um, step for us to take. It plays uh, to our strength, uh, not just to the benefit of Scots, but as these two and many other projects uh, demonstrate, uh, to the very real and tangible benefit of citizens across the world and some of the most impoverished nations. Thank you very much indeed. Ben McPherson to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am also very glad to support the Scottish Government's commitment to making Scotland a hydro nation because water is, of course, fundamental uh, to the importance of Scotland's economy, our health, our social well-being and the environment. And our reputation as a hydro nation is growing. Our water resource is significant and in a world where demanding, demand for more food and water is ever increasing, there's good reason to nurture our water for the long-term sustainable use. From the water of Leith today to the maritime heritage of Leith and Grant and Harbours, the use, management and quality of water resources in my constituency has always been extremely important. And I'd like to use my time today, first of all, to pay tribute to all of those who work in our water industry and, and who've contributed to Scotland's water 
heritage in the past. For example, there is William Kennebon Burton, an engineer born and educated in Edinburgh, who designed the water and sewage systems in Japan and Taiwan in the 19th century, uh, helping to defeat outbreaks of cholera in Japan and uh, through providing safer and cleaner uh, water, and is rightly revered there, who uh, did his apprenticeship at Brown and Brothers and Co Hydraulic and Mechanical Engineers based in my constituency previously. Today, it is the public servants of Scottish Water and others in our water industry whose efforts and contributions we should all highlight and value. And in my constituency, that is particularly true when it comes to the Seafield Wastewater Treatment Works, a very important facility in this city with a growing population. The Seafield Water Treatment Works and its performance are extremely important to the long-term sustainability of our water network. And that is why I want to use my time to, to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the constructive work that we've done so far and our engagement with the communities that I represent through commissioning a strategic review into Seafield. And that, I'm sure, will make a, a significant difference. Tomorrow, those initial findings will be shared with the stakeholders group. And I look forward to working collaboratively with the Cabinet Secretary thereafter to see what uh, progress needs to be made. One of the great strengths of the Seafield work so far is that it's, uh, by, uh, as part of its wastewater treatment, it also generates a significant amount of electricity on the site, uh, making the plant more sustainable. And this leads on to another area that I would like to emphasise as part of Scotland as a hydro nation, which is that the utilisation of our hydro capacity in terms of innovative energy generation as part of our journey to being a low carbon economy. Many have already mentioned Scotland's significant hydroelectric capacity and that's why I, like others, was disappointed that the UK government decided to cut feed-in tariffs of up to 45% uh, in terms of the development of hydropower and that this has unfortunately curtailed hydropower development after a period of renaissance in recent years. An area that's also been highlighted in the debate so far is that of marine energy, and I would particularly like to highlight tidal energy. Now, despite the fact that there is no specific contract for difference from the UK government in terms of the subsidy arrangement for tidal, the Art Scotland's tidal industry is making significant progress, including Nova Innovation, based in my constituency, who have successfully delivered phase one of the world's first offshore tidal array in Shetland, uh, with a 80% Scottish supply chain content. In conclusion, presiding officer, from Leith to elsewhere in Scotland, making Scotland a hydro nation and nurturing our water resource sustainably in the long term is crucial, and the hydro economy provides huge opportunities for growth. And that is, and that as a hydro nation, it is right for us to reach out to the world to share our knowledge and expertise, just as William Kennebon Burton did in the 19th century. Thank you. John Scott to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a 100% shareholder in water distribution and energy services limited which, while registered, is not trading. Presiding officer, I welcome this government debate today as Scotland becoming a hydro nation first launched in 2012. And if any of you have read Fred Pierce's book, When the Rivers Run Dry, you will appreciate what a precious resource water, particularly our Scottish water, is. In a world that is rapidly warming due to climate change and where potable water is a declining world resource, as Stuart Stevenson said. Lord James Douglas Hamilton, late of this place, in an earlier debate warned of future wars being caused by drought and a lack of usable water. And while we take this resource for granted living in Scotland, significant water shortages have already occurred in Europe, notably Spain and Cyprus, with North Africa and Middle Eastern countries becoming daily more arid as well. So I welcome the Scottish Government's intention to sustainably develop Scotland's hydro economy to maximise the economic benefit of our water resources. I also support the aspiration to raise our international profile as leaders in the field of water management and governance. In addition, I note the intention to develop a water research centre 
and would suggest that this could ideally be located in Ayrshire, preferably in my constituency, <laughs> given the abundance of water and rainfall in our area, more of which later. Without doubt, with the world population expected to reach 9 billion by 2050, with climate change now happening in front of our eyes and temperature rises taking place and sea level rises also becoming a reality, the need to manage more carefully fresh water has never been greater in terms of both direct human consumption but also food production. Many of you know this is an issue dear to my heart and again I should declare an interest as a food producer but we should recognise the enormous resource we have in Scotland in terms of available fresh water. Of course, identifying a resource and harnessing and exploiting it are two different things. For example, we have an enormous resource in wave energy and in tidal energy, as mentioned by Marie Todd, which we have not yet been able to significantly access or harness. And fresh water, while more manageable, has not yet been fully appreciated or recognised in Scotland for the resource it will become in future. So that is why I'm a supporter of Scottish water and particularly Scottish water horizons and Scottish water has become one of the Su Scottish Parliament's success stories first set up under Ross Finney's leadership and Scottish water's success and the sensible use of taxpayer money has in large part put Scotland into the position of being able to aspire to becoming a hydro nation as well as creating Scottish water international. Of course, more remains to be done in terms of further improving water quality and river basin management, as well as flood risk management. And, but it would be remiss of me not to mention in this debate the flooding issues in Prestwick in my constituency, which I have been raising in Parliament for many years now. While other countries suffer from a lack of rain, part of Prestwick floods because the local drainage and sewerage system is unable to cope with the volumes of water and sewerage now delivered into this system which lacks the capacity to adequately deal with high rainfall events. So at the risk of sounding like a stuck record on this subject, of great concern nonetheless to my press constituents, I would again ask the government to deliver the funds to Scottish Water to deal with rectifying this problem of external sewer flooding in my constituency and elsewhere. A request I first made to Rosanna Cunningham in September 2010, according to SPICE, and a request which one of my constituents raised very recently with her as well at the SNP conference, I believe. Presiding officer, I welcome again this debate today and look forward to Scotland developing as a hydro nation. Thank you. The last of the open debate speeches is Graeme Day. Presiding officer, uh, Scotland's vast water resource is not something we've only recently come to recognise, nor indeed is exploiting it a recent phenomenon. And against that historic backdrop exists an opportunity to adapt the innovation and technology of hundreds of years ago in order to meet modern demand and play a part in green energy generation. Perth College, as part of the University of the Highlands and Islands, has undertaken research to ascertain the number of historic small-scale hydro sites in the northeast and central Scotland predominantly old water mills. The work was carried out in collaboration with four local authorities, Aberdeenshire, Angus, Fife and Firth and Kinross, with the aim of restoring micro-hydro schemes for modern use. My constituency, the location identified with the greatest potential, is the picturesque Barry Mill. Powered by the Barry Burn, the mill is a Category A listed building owned and operated by the National Trust for Scotland. Barry Mill, which goes back to the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, I think trumping Bruce Crawford's Victorian example, is without doubt one of the greatest historic treasures in my constituency. Did the member give way? <laughs> Bruce Crawford. I think actually Liam MacArthur is probably able to trump everybody, because from what I understand, Scaragabri is where the oldest existing water supply existed from 3000 BC and indeed incorporated a working toilet. So there you go. <laughs> Graham I, I stand corrected. Um, being one of only a handful of mills still powered by water, it's also probably the largest and finest example of its type remaining in working order. The mill continues to be a real tourist attraction in Angus South, where visitors can enjoy guided tours and witness firsthand the uh, intricate process of a fully operated grain mill. Uh, Presiding officer, the, the historic hydropower project is an incredibly exciting proposal. The next stage is for those behind it to work with the local authorities to carry out feasibility studies on the selected sites. 
This would include assessments on a range of criteria, such as potential power outage, uh, proximity to the grid, and the capacity for community involvement in the project. In my patch, Angus Council's Green Economy Officer has already met with the National Trust, and they are working collaboratively to assess the viability of the proposals for Barry Mill. I'm aware that Perth College UHI are currently also working with local authorities and local energy Scotland to put together an application to kickstart a pilot project as soon as possible. I, I hope that proposal for a micro-hydro energy scheme at Barry Mill becomes a reality. The Scottish Government have rightly recognised the role that hydropower can play in their draft energy strategy. And I welcome the capping of business rates increases to 12.5% for small-scale hydro schemes and the 100% rates relief that was put in place for all renewable projects that offer a 0.5 megawatt profit share for their local community. Uh, the former was an issue I had raised on behalf of constituents with the government. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance also took a positive step when he announced last month that the Barclay Review of Plant and Machinery will fast-track the valuation of hydro schemes. It's absolutely vital that we continue in this vein to encourage and support smaller scale innovation in Scotland as we move to cement our place as a global water leader of the future. And let me, as a member of the Environment Committee, finish by paying tribute to the sympathetic way in which many of the new schemes are being constructed. I visited three such schemes on the Invermark, Glen Prosen, and Rotal Estates, two of these in my constituency and the other one in uh, Aberdeenshire. And in each and every case, I was struck by just how well they had been made to blend into the countryside. From a distance, in some cases, you can barely make them out from the surrounding landscape, which for me is a win-win, presiding officer. We now move to the closing speeches for this debate, and I call on David Stewart. Around five minutes, please, Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. This has been a short but excellent debate on the Hydro Nation with wide-ranging contributions from members such as Lee MacArthur uh, and Claudia Bemis, who focused on the international element. Whilst, of course, uh, Donald Cameron also discussed a very important issue of water quality and floodless uh, flood management. Um, Jackie Bailey and Mark Ruskell spoke eloquently about Tom Johnson, who I have to declare is one of my political heroes. Uh, and the less said about the ice cream, I think, uh, the better. I'll move on very swiftly. Uh, members from across the chamber focused on the three main aspects of the hydro nation. Firstly, the development of hydropower to maximise economic benefits by reducing energy use, improving efficiency and creating low carbon uh, nations. Secondly, raising international profile of Scotland as a leader in water management and developing a centre of excellence on water with international reach. And I'd like to focus briefly uh, on hydropower, as other members have, President Officer, um, if you like, a, a case study uh, of, a of the Hydro Nation, not least uh, because of its strong antecedents in my region, uh, the Highlands and Islands. And we all know, of course, that hydropower is a key renewable that can help achieve our climate change targets and reduce reliance on important gas and coal, while, of course, increasing the diversity of our generation mix. Now, members, we need to get our energy mix right. Now, the lights, might mean going, the lights might not be going out over Edinburgh anytime soon, but if we get the energy balance wrong in the next decade, we will be paying over a barrel or indeed over a therm of gas to countries with the political stability of Burma and the civil liberties record of Zimbabwe. We all know that hydropower, if you like, is the grand old man of renewables in Scotland. And the first public supply of hydropower was in the Benedictine Abbey in Fort Augustus in, to 18 and 800 inhabitants in 1890. And in 1896, a hydropower station was built in Foyers by the British Aluminium Company. And around 1900, a large hydropower station was basically responsible for the development of the village of King of Leven. And as members have quoted previously, uh, Tom Johnston, Labour's Secretary of State for Scotland under Winston Churchill, led the hydro revolution. And in the 1940s, he created a network of dams and transmission towers that uh, produced electricity to poor Highlanders for the first time. And Tom Johnston, of course, when he left Parliament in 1945, went off to chair the Hydro Board and the Labour government, just to complete the record, uh, nationalised hydropower in its first term in 1945. At that time, presiding officer, it was estimated that only one farm in six and only one croft in a hundred had electricity. And today, notwithstanding Donald Cameron's point, virtually every home has mains electricity. And after the Second World War, uh, workers came from all over the world uh, to work in the Highland Hydro schemes. 
Uh, Germans, Poles and Czechs in particular were famed as the Tunnel Tigers, who earned 10 times the weekly wage uh, of local estate workers. But by the 1960s, the Highlands had changed beyond all recognition due to new dams on larger locks. Rivers were diverted to aqueducts and underground tunnels to direct powers from the glens to remote crofts uh, and farms. And what was then once a threat to tourism is now, of course, a tourist attraction. For example, the dam and fish ladder at Pitlochley, the dreaded venue of many a Sunday school uh, outing, is now a major tourist attraction visited by hundreds of thousands of people each year. But hydropower is not some bygone relic of a forgotten age. The Glendale project, which I visited a few years ago uh, near the banks of Loch Ness, is the largest hydropower station for half a century. And it provides clean renewable energy, enough to light uh, every house in Glasgow. And recently, uh, a new £14 million hydro scheme is up and running in Loch Haber, based in the hills above King Loch Leven. Villagers will get substantial uh, community benefit. However, as has been pointed out, the reduction in UK tariffs by the UK government makes the economies of building uh, new hydro increasingly uh, challenging. So I believe there's opportunities for a new hydro revolution. There is some limiting factors, Presiding Officer. We have to look at the cost of grid connections, the reduction in phasing out of foot payments, uh, and the uh, consent process. And Scotch Renewables raised concern about the route to market and the lack of financial certainty for those investing in small-scale hydro, not least community groups. And in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I believe Scotland has a proud record in hydropower, in no small measure due to the iconic status of Tom Johnston. There is so much more to achieve, for example, in pumped electricity storage, in run-of-the-river developments, and by streamlining planning processes. We all know the task is great, but Scotland has both the opportunities and skills necessary. Sustainable development of hydropower can be a crucial contribution to meeting our global climate change responsibilities. With the appropriate development, the right technology and the proven skills of our workforce, Scotland can take the lead in Europe and beyond. I call Maurice Golden. Around seven minutes, please. Good. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I refer members to my register of interests with respect to my work in Zero Waste Scotland on phosphorus and priority substance recovery. Um, let me begin by briefly highlighting the three amendments to the, to the motion uh, from the Scottish Government which we are supporting. Uh, the first uh, relates to phosphorus and priority substance and I'll, I'll cover that in terms of the recovery of that resource as something that we must do in order pr to protect the environment and indeed biodiversity. The second area is ensuring that our river basin management plans and f flood risk management uh, plans are more uh, effective across the whole of Scotland. We've got some great practice, but we need that spread out and we need local authorities uh, involved in that. And the third area in terms of improving the market uh, for uh, the business sector would involve ideally the introduction of a, a not-for-profit uh, company who runs on an ESCO uh, style model which, which could share in the benefits of water efficiencies and I think that would be a, a, a useful introduction into the mar market. But let me re reaffirm my party's commitment to protecting and harnessing the benefits of Scotland's abundant water resources. Scotland has the potential to be the international lead in water management projects, and we can and should provide expertise and research around the world by developing initiatives that will help people and tackle climate change. The Hydro Nation strategy is to be welcomed, and we will seek to hold the SNP government to account in implementing this strategy. The SNP have spoken about their commitment to developing Scotland's water sector and to raising our international pro profile as a hydro nation, and that's something else that we welcome. We've heard today a number of interesting and worthwhile contributions from across the chamber in what has largely been a consensual debate. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned in her opening remarks that we, we must optimise and understand water use, that we must demonstrate exemplary uh, practice and share this with the world. I agree with that. Bruce Crawford spoke about the scenic attraction of Loch Catron, as well as sharing an ice cream on Loch Lomond with Jackie Bailey, who in her remarks highlighted issues around business rates for hydro schemes. 
but a top priority for Scotland should be addressing the amount of pharmaceutical and chemical waste that is appearing in Scotland's rivers, lochs and seas. I would like to highlight the case of Lulu the whale, found dead on the Isle of Tyree. Her body contains shocking levels of PCB or polychlorinated biphenyl. I've been practicing that all day. Uh, chemicals take a long time to break down. Therefore, the estimated £75 million of pharmaceuticals that are dispensed with but never used, often ending up in the natural environment, should be an additional concern. Researchers have found some traceable content in drinking water. Water treatment plants cannot effectively recover these potentially harmful chemicals. The potential long-term environmental and health risks of pharmaceutical residue in water are a matter of concern. Healthcare Without Harm is one organisation which works to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces the environmental uh, footprint, becomes a community anchor for sustainability and a leader in new technologies and practices. The use of a system such as the Swedish WISE list, which can be used to compare health outcomes with environmental impacts, would be a positive step forward in terms of physicians prescribing new drugs. And I would urge the SNP government to look at this more closely. Donald Cameron spoke in his remarks about one of the goals of the Hydro Nation being to create a low carbon water nation where carbon intensity is reduced. And while I welcome the progress from Scottish Water on this, I would like that to go further. Stuart Stevenson talked about the potential for water wars internationally going forward, and he's absolutely right in that point. I would refer the member to the UNESCO Centre for Water Law and Policy in Dundee, of which I'm an alumni with respect to their work on the application of a water hierarchy uh, and to use EU Water Framework D Directive as a dis dispute resolution, resolution management system throughout water courses in the world. But I commend the international links that have been established with countries such as Malawi and India, and this was a point well made by Liam MacArthur. Donald Cameron highlighted the work of the UK government in helping 64.5 million people gain access to clean water and sanitation, and welcomed the target that a further 60 million would have access by 2020. This work also complements the work of the Scottish government. Peter Chapman highlighted the issues uh, faced by farmers, not surprisingly, as a result of the wettest summer since 1985, and also stressed the importance of quality water for the whisky industry. Indeed, as climate change continues to affect global weather patterns, Scotland becomes increasingly vulnerable to extreme flooding. And that's why enhanced river basin management plans and flood risk management plans will be required. We must do more to protect communities. The water market for business customers is currently imperfect and we believe it needs uh, reform. I recognise that deregulation has led to savings for Scottish businesses, but similar to the consumer energy market, businesses need more information and advice and indeed support to switch to companies in order to get the best deal. Uh, indeed, bundling together with other utilities is another way to drive down costs and improve service. And certainly, for us on these benches, an energy service company, an ESCO, being introduced to the market would also be an improvement because a commercial non-for-profit business providing a broad range of solutions and sharing in the benefits of efficiencies would be beneficial. Claudia Beamish highlighted the issues around uh, small-scale hydro and a community-led approach and the introduction of a project manager would be very useful in facilitating uh, that. So to conclude, I welcome the fact that Scotland is becoming an international le leader. Uh, we need to take seriously the value of Scotland's water for the sake of our climate, economy and international profile as a hydro nation. I call on Alistair Allen to close this debate. Can you take us up to just before five, please, Minister? 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me begin uh, today by thanking all members uh, for their very valuable and considered contributions. This has been a wide-ranging discussion, uh, a constructive one, and one that has produced many unusual images, perhaps, as you've heard from previous contributions, one image more unusual uh, than, than most. Um, and I think that um, certainly the, the revelation uh, of Mr Crawford going to Loch Catron to share ice creams with Jackie Bailey uh, is one that will live long with us, uh, not least because um, I understand that already, I understand that already the considerable combined forces of Twitter and Photoshop have come together to ensure <laughs> that it now has a, a much wider audience than any I could possibly give it. So can I thank uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform for setting out the impressive breadth of the Scottish Government's Hydro Nation agenda and uh, particularly can I thank Rosanna Cunningham um, for the way in which she's allowed um, many members to, to point out and, and, uh, um, and, and dwell upon the, the fundamental uh, importance of water as a resource, its critical nature for life underpinning everything that we do. And it's right that we should take a systematic and wide-ranging approach to how we manage that resource and develop its value. So I wish uh, also to reiterate, reiterate our thanks to the Hydro Nation Forum for their role in helping Scot the Scottish Government to develop that Hydro Nation strategy. The strategy which is tested and agreed with the Forum at its biannual meetings, chaired by uh, the Cabinet Secretary sets out action and plans under four key heads or themes. The themes cover activity um, focused on national, international knowledge and innovation-led aspects uh, of water. I want to, to address some of the points that were raised which relate to, to the national theme, if I may, which sets out the key activities in the domestic agenda being delivered under this strategy. We heard about uh, Scottish Water's successful journey to becoming a world-class utility delivering services to the majority of people in Scotland and their success in meeting and indeed surpassing performance targets while reducing costs and environmental impact was rightly held up by many members as an example of how public ownership can deliver re results right across the board for people in Scotland. And we heard too about the ongoing action under the Hydro Nation agenda to tackle the particular supply challenges faced by some of our most rural communities. Now we've heard about the need for innovation as a means of reducing costs for consumers, um, for its contribution to lower environmental impact and increased energy efficiency, and indeed the development of a flourishing water economy. It's important too that we also had uh, the chance to discuss the, the knowledge theme of this debate, uh, this uh, theme that recognised the strength uh, in our universities and research institutions uh, in relation to water and the work of our researchers and academics, which is making a significant contribution to understanding and uh, tackling uh, key issues across a broad front. Hydro Nation is helping to demonstrate to the world where Scottish ex expertise is leading the way or contributing to better resource management, whether that's in relation to water scarcity, access to adequate, safe and affordable drinking water and sanitation, or developing thinking and mechanisms to tackle globally significant transboundary legal issues. We've heard how in the fields of economic and non-economic regulation and governance, Scottish expertise is increasingly acknowledged as an exemplar of best practice and is increasingly in demand. We, noticed how, um, hydro, we noted how Hydro Nation International uh, is building on the strengths of the established and respected crew model to bring together better alignment and consistency uh, to the outward facing Hydro Nation activity. Not only that, but the initiative will develop stronger academic networks at home that can contribute and support other strategic priorities. Now, we've seen that the Hydro Nation agenda is also an international agenda, uh, a point picked up on by Donald Cameron and, and many others in the course of this debate. <coughs> Scotland recognises that as a responsible nation in the world, it has a duty to contribute to solving global issues where it can bring its expertise to bear. And the abundant water resources we benef benefit from in Scotland undoubtedly contribute to the quality and distinctiveness of Scotland's environment. While we enjoy access to excellent quality drinking water and high standards of sanitation, 
Many, many millions around the world are not so fortunate. Now, last year, I had the very humbling experience of meeting women in a Malawian village who pointed out the effects of what they recognised themselves to be climate change, explaining the practical consequences of that for them, which was that they had to walk several more miles a day each just to get water. Now, I'm proud that Scotland was one of the first countries in the world to publicly commit to the new Sustainable Development Goals in September 2015, and it's heartening to see the direct contribution that Hydro Nation is making to the achievement of those goals in Malawi and in other parts of the world. I'm pleased that Malawi was mentioned um, in the Labour Amendment, uh, which um, the, the Government is happy to support, um, because uh, of our ongoing relationship uh, with that country and because of uh, the Hydro Nation contribution to the Climate Justice Fund, uh, which has already ensured that uh, over 30,000 people have gained access to clean water and many more are supported. I think uh, I also want to, to make mention of the fact that uh, the Scottish Government does similarly good uh, and important work in India and uh, that the Ganga River Health Project uh, led by uh, the UNESCO Centre for uh, Water, Law, Policy and Science uh, is one that we're very ha happy to uh, cooperate with. And I think, too, that um, it's, uh, if I can uh, just address one or two of the, th the themes uh, in the amendments, um, I think uh, it's important to say that uh, with regard to um, the Conservative amendment, I'm not sure that we did, after all the debate, uh, quite learn uh, the thinking behind every aspect uh, of or every intention behind that uh, amendment. There is much in it that would be uh, unobjectionable, uh, except, uh, as I say, that the last line of the amendment um, I would say fails to recognise the, the benefits um, that uh, public ownership has, has brought to uh, uh, our uh, water industry. Uh, I will, yes. Sir Morris Golden. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if the member could clarify whether the, the, the SNP government are arguing that the market for business supply is, is perfect and whether the market would benefit from a not-for-profit uh, ESCO sharing model being introduced to that market as an offer for uh, business customers in Scotland? Minister. Well, we feel that at the moment uh, not only is the market uh, properly competitive in the, the, the customer's interest, but uh, that with 87% of our water bodies achieving a good status classification uh, by 2027, but more importantly, public support for the public uh, ownership principle, uh, I don't think we need to depart from that principle. I think also, uh, when it comes to the, the Labour uh, amendment, I think that uh, I can happily support that, not least because of, as I mentioned, uh, the support which it uh, expresses for uh, people in the developing world and their right uh, to enjoy uh, a decent water supply. I'm happy to conclude on that note by saying, before I do briefly, that um, uh, Ms Cunningham is happy to, to meet, uh, uh, she's in, indicated to me with John Scott about the constituency issues that he diligently raised. But can I conclude in that case, uh, Presiding Officer, merely by saying that the annual Hydro Nation report laid in Parliament tells a story of how we're moving uh, from a, a potential to a genuine opportunity um, to uh, have a first-class, world-class contribution uh, to the debate about water in the world uh, and a contribution that, to make in that that we can be proud of, not only in what we have achieved in Scotland, but what we can achieve in the wider world. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Hydro Nation. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Bureau, to move motion 8416 on committee membership and motion 8421 on substitution on committees. Move together. Thank you very much. And we come now to decision time. There are five questions today. The first question is that amendment 8378.1 in the name of Donald Cameron, which seeks to amend motion 8378 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the hydronation maximising the abundant benefits of our water resources be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 8378.1 in the name of Donald Cameron is yes, 32, no, 74. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 8378.3 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that Motion 8378 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, as amended on the hydronation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Motion 8416, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on committee membership, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the final question is that Motion 8421, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on substitution on committees, is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.